Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm still trying to recover from being mentioned in Mark Stein's speech. That's, um, <laughs> there, there are certain achievements in life, and I think that that's one of them. The other, the other was getting a parking spot at work with my name on it. So, um, What I'm particularly pleased about at this conference is that um, people are making presentations that I was doing 30 years ago. That sounds arrogant, but it's taken a while for the community to catch up with what was going on. And of course, it was because I was so far ahead that I, was, that I received the lawsuits that I did. I had two threats. One was that they couldn't say I wasn't qualified. The second was that I had an ability to explain complex issues to the public in a way they could understand. And therefore, I had to be isolated. Just to, up -to, -date, just to bring you up to date on the lawsuits, um, there are two, of course, outstanding, one by Andrew Weaver and the other by Michael Mann. I happen to think personally that the Andrew Weaver lawsuit is more important. The Michael Mann one is, is more important on a larger scale, as Mark explained to you. But of course, Weaver was the um, a lead author and co-author in four of the IPCC reports from 1995 through. But more importantly, he was in control of the computer models. And as we know, that's where the gospel was input and the gospel was outputted. And they did a circular argument. They unpit, put in what they wanted. It gave them what they wanted. And then they said, that proves that we're correct. It's, it's a classic circular argument that was used with the computer models. Um, I'm very, very pleased about the Canadian prime minister at the G7 taking the stand that he did. I think that it's partly um, that he's forced into that position because the Canadian government was so instrumental in the, uh, the whole IPC setup and the Kyoto Protocol and so on. And, and, and of course, I'm always reminded of, of the question about why did the Canadian cross the road? <laughs> and the answer was to get to the middle. <laughs> And, and what, what, what's particularly funny about that is that it fills both stereotypes because to an American that's an insult and a Canadian says, what's wrong with that? <laughs> so so uh, with that, I want to uh, identify how the whole structure of the IPCC, the Agenda 21 and everything else was designed to isolate people who were then um, attacked, such as Willie Soon or myself. These people had to be ide uh, uh, um, identified. And this cartoon, of course, the Inquisition, and it says, um, how dare you challenge the um, uh, idea of uh, the, the scientific debate. And of course, that, that's the issue. Uh, yes, the free speech issue is blocked. But as somebody else said in a presentation yesterday, they've, they've totally destroyed and bypassed the scientific method. And in, in order to do that, of course, they had to establish certain criteria. It is no coincidence that the 97% consensus was created. Anything less than that would put doubt in the public's mind. Imagine if it was only an 80% consensus. <laughs> then the public could say, well, 20%, that's a pretty large number. But 3%, no, we can easily marginalize those. And by the way, the consensus word first came in this debate from Richard Lindzen when he said about the IPCC that the consensus was reached before the research had even begun. And I think that that's a very, very good assessment as, of as what has happened. And of course, ever, ever since, they have had to uh, per perpetuate what, what they had done and what they had said. So in, in setting up, um, they effectively used a business plan. Of course, Morris Strong, um, again, a Canadian, so we can apologize for him. Um, and, and he's the reason, by the way, that the chairman of the first meeting on the setting up of the IPCC in, in Villach, Austria in 1985 was Gordon McBean, who was an assistant deputy minister with Environment Canada. But Strong came out of the business world, and so he set up a business plan for the whole agenda, and it's a declaration, this is his comment, a declaration on the human environment, an action plan, and an organizational structure supported by a World Environment Fund. 
So you see in that the basis of how this was going to be done, how it was going to be achieved. And of course, uh, just as with Al Gore's movie, you can hate it and despise it, but the reality is it was a superb piece of propaganda. And you can despise and hate Morris Strong, but what he did and what he achieved is really quite remarkable, and I'll come back to that point in a minute. So the whole, from the very start, politics and science of human-caused climate change became paralleled through the auspices of the United Nations Environment Program. And of course, Strong told Elaine Dewar when she interviewed him that that's why he went to the UN, where he could get all the money he wanted and not be accountable to anybody. And that's precisely what happened. And of course, the structure that he set up with him at the top as the head of the United Nations Environment Program, there were two bra branches to it, the political and the scientific going hand in hand. And down the right hand, or the left hand side, I should say, is, is uh, culminating in Agenda 21. And on the other side, of course, was the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, out of, uh, with directions to the World Meteorological Organization. And Strong knew that if he could control the bureaucracies of the world, he could control the politicians. And so the IPCC was made up of appointed people by the national weather offices in every country in the world. And the reason for that was, of course, because they could then push the agenda and the politicians would say, well, hang on a minute. And they say, well, what do you know about climate science? We're the experts. You hired us as experts. So there was a built-in guarantee that the bureaucrats would control the whole uh, agenda going forward. And then, of course, the, the feedback was the, from the Intergovernmental Panel's findings went back to the COP, which was the political agency set up to uh, move things forward. That's why the leaking of the emails at, at, at the uh, COP15 in Copenhagen was so critical because COP depended on the science of the IPCC. And then to have it exposed that it was wrong, the COP was in a real dilemma. They were in a real bind that the agencies they, that they were legally required to depend on were shown to be a fraud. And so that feedback mechanism created that problem. Uh, Voltaire said, if you wish to converse with me, define your terms. And of course, what they did was they defined climate change um, and, and this is from Article 1 of the UNFCCC. Climate change means a change of climate which is attributed directly or indirectly to human activity that uh, alters the composition of the global atmosphere and which is in addition to a natural climate variability. We've kept pointing out that limits, of course, them only to looking at, at human causes, which is why they left out all of the natural causes. Most of the public don't know this. Most of the politicians don't know this. And I'll come later on to how they're trying to deal with it now to backtrack. And of course, one of the problems they had at the IPCC was their, their process is cumulative. So what they did in the first one, the second one, the second one simply added on to what they'd done in the first one. So if they were going to change anything, they had to go back and start over again. So if they were going to say, well, we're going to look at all natural climate variability, they'd have to scrap the whole IPCC process. But this was, was, this was part of the major deception. And of course, what it, what it guaranteed was that anybody that stepped up and said, well, hang on a minute, what about the sun? Oh, skeptic, got to marginalize them, part of the 3%. And so the whole process was designed to marginalize those that would dare to question. And if you're only 3% that are questioning as they're proving, then you've got a problem. And the WG1 report um, a lot of people don't realize this, but the three reports, uh, one, two, and three, two and three accept without question what one is saying. So when you talk about the agreements amongst the IPCC, it's built into the process. And the, uh, the W1 report says, in climate research, well, first of all, uh, back up a bit here, but one of the things that they very cleverly did was that they got the summary for policymakers, which goes to the public and, of course, is a falsified document. But in the physical report uh, of WG1, they said, here's all the limitations. This process can't work. But they knew nobody would ever read that. <laughs> and they knew that even if they read it, they wouldn't understand it. And if anybody like Willie Soon or myself pointed out, hey, hang on, oh, marginalized again. 
And so here's the, uh, the one piece, and this, this came out in uh, the 2001 report. In climate research and modeling, we should recognize we are dealing with a coupled nonlinear chaotic system, and therefore the long-term prediction of future climate states is not possible. <laughs> and now we'll have a conference on climate change. So, so in other words, they deliberately acknowledged all the limitations, knowing that nobody would know about it, and the few that did, they could very easily marginalize, and they could threaten with lawsuits and all sorts of other things. In, within the IPCC, of course, the three groups, as I said, working group one and two and three, this is from working group two. It says, after confirming in the first volume on the physical science basis, that climate change is occurring now, mostly as a result of human activities. This volume illustrates the impact of global warming. And it's out of that report that all of the hysteria, though this is going to happen with global warming, this is the, the, the threats and the scares, and of course that's what the media feed on. But, it, but it's guaranteed to be, to, to be that way because of the findings of working group one. And so, as I said, they, they built in a self-adjusting and self-correcting problem for the lies that they were trying to perpetrate. And here's uh, David Wojcik, who was a, a, a reviewer, an expert reviewer for the IPCC, about the SPM, the Summary for Policymakers. He said, glaring emissions are only glaring to experts, to the policy... Um, um, so the policymakers, including the press and the public who read the SPM, will not realize they are being told only one side of a story. But the scientists who drafted the SPM know the truth, as recorded by the sometimes artful way they, they um, conceive it. And so, again, people knew what was going on, and the SPM was deliberately created. And, and of course, the question I've always asked is, how did those scientists doing the Physical One report cope with, they must have known that the SPM was completely different to what they were saying, but none of them ever spoke out about it. None of them ever said anything to, about Al Gore's uh, Peace Prize. And of course, I, I, I won't even bother with that cartoon. Um, it got attacks against challengers almost from the start. Currently, the level of tax have, have increased. Willie Soon and Sally Balyunas got attacked very early by John Holdren, orchestrated uh, at Harvard and so on. And now the attacks are, are increasing again because um, climate change is central to President Obama's domestic and foreign policies. And I will show you this cartoon. And what it says is um, another insult. How can Obama say we are not as great a threat as <laughs> global warming? For a start, for a start, we don't pause. <laughs> And we execute deniers. I think that, that, yeah. That is, uh, now you know why cartoonists have a high suicide rate. <laughs> they, they see the realities and have a hard time with it. Of course, the critical meeting in, in Paris is another pressure for the increased attacks. And of course, then the uh, public concern about climate change the polls, this is the UN poll showing that climate change is at the very bottom of people's concern. That's increasing their, their challenge. And, and this is the Pew Center poll where global warming is right down at the bottom. And then the other problem is that countries, and we've seen this, uh, China, uh, China particularly not even bothering to attend. One very important point, and we talk about tipping points, the moral high ground which the environmentalists and the IPCC had taken was undercut when India came out and said, you're telling us the global temperature might increase by half a degree in the next 60 years and you're not even certain about that. We got bigger problems. We got people starving to death, thank you very much. That changed the moral high ground uh, component. Okay. Uh, three major conditions that challenge us in the future. This is a plot of, that shows that 80% of students are art students and, and only 20% science students. And here's the, uh, the, that first one was for high school, this is for college. You see the same one. The highest percentage, Finland and Germany, the US down below 20%. So you've got 80% that are not gonna understand what you're saying, and in fact are almost proud they don't understand what you're saying, <laughs> right? 
And then this, this one shows the um, uh, distribution of undergraduates at Michigan State. And you'll see here that um, I think it's 17% uh, that are identified as in the sciences or engineering. So that's the challenge that we have is to uh, educate those people. The other one is um, the Yale, Yale education did a, 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 a survey of people's knowledge about um, climate. These are results they got, 77% failed. I think they had to get the money, they had to publish something, so they curved the results. Right? And they said they had to curve the results because the questions were too hard. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Anyway, um, so in, in the, um, in the uh, 2007 report, they changed the definition of climate change. And they said that climate change in IPCC usage refers to any change in climate over time, whether due to natural variability or as a result of human activity. That's completely different than the original definition. And it only appears in the footnote <laughs> of the summary of, of the 2007 report. But this is another way of them saying, oh yeah, we look at natural climate variability, look at our definition. That's the way they play the game. They build it in and then they can say, see, we did say it. It's those deniers that are denying that we're saying it. And just one last point, and I, I know I'm supposed to stop, but Margaret Mead, and this is a great challenge. Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. The public can't believe that a small group of people have been able to fool the world. And yet that is what exactly has happened. And so to get past that and to help the public understand what is going on is the challenge for the future. Mahatma Gandhi said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they attack you, then you win. <laughs> it, Guess what? We're in the attack phase. <laughs> We're on the verge of winning, and I've sent that, sensed this more than at any previous Heartland conference I've been at. Thank you. Uh -huh.